AJ Toy, more people for his yeah. life than yeah. Oh, who's she? Kate, no, not Kate. Kate, is it on her school board email? No, it's, it's, no, no, it's, it's the boundaries. Oh, it's not even other stuff. How old is she? Let me focus on that. Let me focus on that until I have to do it. Are we ready? Oh, hey, Dr. Steven. <laughs> Call the meeting order. Uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Since we're in person, um, all of us, I did not need to establish a quorum. Uh, we didn't have anyone wishing to address the school board. I would just like to introduce to everyone at Southeast Tech College who has maybe have not met Dr. Stavum, the new superintendent of the school board. I know she's met with Dr. Griggs, but I don't know if she's met with everyone else. So thanks for joining us today. We'll move on to the approval of the minutes of the June 3rd, 2020 meeting. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Uh, the minutes pass. Approval agenda. Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor of approval of the, of the agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. We have approved the agenda. There were no new conflicts of interest presented. I'll move on to approval of the consent agenda items 8A through D. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same time. We have approved the consent agenda. Now to the reports of the president. Public hearing on the FY21 proposed budget. We'll have Rich speak first and we'll open up the public hearing. All right, President Mickelson, uh, members of the board, uh, this is the public hearing for the tentative adoption of Southeast Tech's uh, FY21 budget. Uh, this is a really a follow-up to the presentation I made at May 26th uh, board meeting. Not a, not a lot of changes at this point, um, so I won't uh, run you through the whole thing and spend the whole 40 minutes since those guys have an over and under on me on whether I'm going to be 10 minutes or not. So we'll, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see who see who exchanges money afterwards. Uh, just a, a couple things on the kind of basic assumptions uh, as we move in this tentative adoption. Uh, when we presented on May 26, we talked about we had not yet uh, rolled in the per student allocation adjustment of the 2%. That still is not reflected at this tentative adoption. I'll get to kind of the reasons why we're taking a conservative approach on that. Uh, second piece in the legislative appropriation and funding was uh, capital equipment. Uh, we didn't know what our exact allocation was, but between, between the four technical colleges it was 1.5 million. So uh, we haven't factored and rolled that into it. And there's a reason why for that as well, again, on this conservative approach. Still the big unknown for us as we head into this fall term is who's gonna show up? Uh, how many students are actually going to commit to uh, what we know today. Uh, the enrollment is still pacing out ahead of where it was last year at 5%, so that's a good sign. Uh, it's a positive today. That's similar to the numbers I presented to you 45 days ago. So that continues to hold. But as I mentioned at that date, uh, there's, no, there's no cost to take in the off-ramp. Uh, so what actually happens uh, if we see a spike in cases, uh, people may start to make some different decisions. Uh, you'll hear some different uh, conversations about our plans that we have. Uh, we're rolling that out on how to resume operations. Obviously, we're uh, closely tied to what CDC and uh, the South Dakota Department of Health and we even are engaging uh, the local health officials with the uh, City of Sioux Falls Health Department. So the intent is to, to resume operations as we normally would have them. But again, there's assumptions there. There's always a conservative approach. Uh, still a little bit unknown on if there's gonna be a legislative special session or not. We 
been told that, yeah, you can count on that money, you can rely on that. Um, so I think that'll be good. So when we bring the final adoption in September, a couple things. We'll know where we're at on those uh, appropriations. We will have a better sense of our fall enrollment numbers too, because we'll be past the drop ad period. So we'll know kind of what we anticipate where we will end up. The reason, and then we can blend in those dollars at that time. If for some reason enrollment drops off through that drop ad period, that PSA money that will be coming forward with the state appropriation, that becomes a buffer for us. It, it creates an opportunity that, okay, if our revenue is declining, we haven't programmed those dollars as of today. So that gives us the flexibility to turn around and program them. On the capital equipment, uh, in the budget this year, we are utilizing some of our own funds for capital equipment. It's not all federal dollars. Again, if the enrollments decline, but the state appropriation comes, we can supplant, uh, because it's not federal dollars or state dollars, our own dollars with that state funding that's gonna come forward. And that gives us, again, a little more of a buffer. So that's, that's kind of the premise of why we haven't rolled that into this yet. We haven't specifically programmed it. We're, we're leaving it on the table as, as a conservative approach if we start to see a decline. The opposite side of that is we programmed it and we see that decline. Now we're into a whole lot different conversation about how do we react to those cuts in the very near term. I just think this is a better strategy going forward. With that said, knew how to run a computer, we would get to actually look at this stuff. Bear with me, sorry. I'm gonna ask questions. When is when is remind me what the first day of school is so I can start? Same as public school. And then when is the last drop date for the class? It'll be two weeks into the term, so I'm not sure what the what is the exact start date. I think it's sooner than that. That's right, that's the last right. Is it? Okay. So we'll probably look to push our meeting back uh, into past that pass that date right to allow us to uh, make those adjustments. Huh. I had lunch with Jack Colbeck. Uh, yeah, where's, where's our IT guy? <laughs> <laughs> did you break it? Yeah, I did. So this uh, cuts in on my over and under time. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's the mouse. I, I did have lunch over. with uh, Jack Colbeck yesterday from the legislature and he also stated that they are not planning to have a, a reconvening of the legislature on budget. So, no, um, and that's talking with appropriations. So let's keep our fingers crossed, but that's what he said yesterday. Okay, so we're here. Right. Thank you. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. 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 All right. Thanks, Eric. Eric's there, Ryan. <laughs> He's got the over on the bed, so that's why he set this thing up. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, he set it up so I'd go over the 10 minutes. <laughs> we haven't changed our enrollment projections, as I stated. We are, uh, again, pacing ahead of comparable time to last year with new incoming students. Uh, so that's a good thing. So we haven't revised this. Uh, if you recall, uh, the modeling that I use is to tend to look backwards in the last 12 months of what our enrollments are and then project any growth in new programs. So that's what's reflected here. And again, uh, in September, maybe there'll be some adjustments to this, but so far, um, everything's looking good and maybe even be a little bit of an uptick on that. Nothing's changed in the terms of the proposed rates the State Board of Technical Education, as you're aware of, sets our tuition rate, so that's holding steady at 121. Our budget's not asking for anything on the local level, so that uh, stays the same. Uh, the only increase to students this year is a $1 per credit. 
and that was set by the Board of Technical Education, and that's on the facility fee. So that's uh, to provide a funding mechanism for the debt service on our system-wide uh, construction projects. Uh, and then there was just a shift in that state outreach fee. They moved that over into an M&R uh, category to be used and dedicated towards uh, maintenance and repair on the campuses. But overall, the increased cost to students is a dollar credit, uh, which is, in I think my 16 years, unprecedented. Uh, I don't think we've ever had one that low. So you know, hopefully for students, that'll be a positive. On the revenue side of things, the only thing that's changed from the May 26th is we uh, firmed up our Perkins federal allocation. Uh, so you'll see that come up by $69,000, $70,000. So from a revenue standpoint, this is the only change uh, from uh, the prior presentation. The budget, looking at it revenues-wise, is, is fairly flat, obviously, with a $1 increase in credits and, and overall credits being relatively the same. Uh, that's what you would uh, expect to see. The changes from the prior year uh, related to the state uh, really have to do with some one-time funding. Uh, the $500,000 in GOED for the construction project that's underway, uh, that obviously doesn't carry over in the FY21. Uh, there was some one-time money coming from the state, which was actually that old uh, outreach fee that the state had held. They had some funds in that. They dispersed that, and we've received all of it. So it's all here. Standing. Yeah, we just got the just got the last check this last week. So, so we have been made whole on that aspect. Uh, so those are those are the big changes. Uh, other on the state side of it was the Board of Regents Gen Ed Agreement. Uh, I talked about that before. That has sunsetted. We'll be looking at it different mechanism for that, but we no longer are required to transfer the tuition that we collect to them. Conversely, they are no longer required to pay us for our instructional classes or instructional costs in delivering those transferable gen ed classes. So you'll see a reduction on the expenditure side that, that is offset between these two. And really for us, it was a good thing because we were sending more to them than we were getting back. So. That's had a positive impact on the development of this budget this year. Again, the breakout, uh, clearly uh, the majority of it is really credit-based, and I've talked about that before, uh, in tuition, in fees, charges to students, but also our state aid is based off of enrollments from the prior year. So that's an important element of, of it as well, while the state increases the PSA uh, the actual dollar amounts that we receive is, is based, one, on total enrollments uh, of ours, and then in comparison to the other technical institutes, or technical colleges, excuse me, and then in comparison to in specific programs. So that funding formula is, is, uh, has multiple layers to it, but again, every the majority of our funding mechanisms are really tied to enrollments. That's why we spend and focus so much time and effort on that. Expenditures, there was changes in all of these categories related to the Perkins uh, and to the federal funds. But again, it's all related to those dollars. So there was some changes uh, related to uh, a position that we were bringing on that is not going to take benefits. Uh, so that frees up some dollars to redirect that. So we made some changes in uh, professional development areas with the increased allocation of more capital expenditures, uh, dollars that we have available. So we kind of reshifted around what we were doing uh, with those federal Perkins dollars for equipment. Wage is just a little bit of change as we are going through the hiring process. Uh, we are increasing some contract lengths of replacement instructors, but the offset to that is it reduces our adjunct. So there's a, there's a win and a, and a deduct, so to speak, as we make those changes. So. Again, overall revenue and expenditures, it's still a balanced budget, is only changing by about $70,000 uh, from the previous presentation. Uh, use of funds, uh, talked about this a little bit before. Uh, you know, clearly we're a, a technical college, so we're heavy into the academics, uh, and that's where the, the bulk of our resources are being spent. Uh, this changes from year to year just because we don't have a special capital outlay fund our capital expenditures are blended within that post-secondary fund. So you'll see a little bit of movement of that depending upon 
the size and scope of our capital projects. So a few years ago when we built the hub, that ratio would have looked much different because that was such a huge piece of it, that, that capital investment. As we look at it by the use of those funds uh, from an object code, from an accounting terminology, again, heavily into wages and benefits. Uh, we're in the people business. Uh, so 66% uh, of our expenditures are really tied to uh, full-time, part-time uh, staffing dollars and the, and the related benefits associated with that. Uh, again, capital investments change that from year to year, but generally it falls in that 65 to 70% range uh, in human capital. Capital improvements, that's just, uh, that remained unchanged. Uh, and again, just the split between building improvements and site improvements. Uh, capital equipment, again, this was a little bit of an adjustment uh, with the additional funds coming from Perkins. So last time you would have seen the land surveys so we're buying some equipment, some drones uh, for, for that program and moved around a little bit of the allocation between the new dental program and the new vet tech program. But again, utilizing the Perkins to the maximum extent. So the gray categories in there are the local dollars and would be if for some reason the wheels fall off and enrollment starts to decline, but we still get our state appropriation, we'd still be able to buy this stuff, but we would use the state dollars for this and possibly uh, make revenue adjustments and offset against this. This is probably the one that it was not completed last time and was still a work in progress. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of little bit of time on this and just a couple things I wanna draw your attention to. If we look at the, the first column, FY20 projected, one of the things I wanted to mention in there is uh, you see a reserve for FY21. The way our accounting structure is we really don't reserve, the dollars are already reserved, but I wanted to point out that the related to the existing vet tech expansion, some of the Terry Avenue extension, some of those expenses haven't hit our ledger yet because of just the timing of it, of when that happens, but they're programmed in FY20. So what I wanted to demonstrate is, while if you were to exclude that out of there, you'd say, wow, we wound up you know, $2.2 .2 million ahead. This is really a good year. We should have a pandemic every year. Uh, that, that's not the case. Uh, it's just a timing difference. And so I wanna make sure under, that folks understand that probably in September, I'll be able to bring back in that as a supplemental appropriation using the reserves that we end up with this year. And by the time we get to September, we'll have a better measure of that. Uh, we get done doing our year end entries, we'll know where we're at. Now the upshot to that is, and this is another one of these conservative approaches, when we developed the FY20 budget and adopted that, that included a use of our uh, existing reserves of about 880,000, 885,000. If my projection, which should be a little more accurate this year since we're a little closer to the end of the year when I did it, right now it's only showing a utilization of $230,000. If that goes up a little bit in terms of the negative, it's because the 2555 will be coming down uh, and we won't be carrying over as much. But the point I'm making is overall, we are in a good position going into FY21 based on where we thought we were gonna be in FY20 and where it looks like we're actually gonna be. Some of that savings was in the early retirement. Uh, we had one time some money in there, half a million dollars because of the changes in that. Uh, that utilization was probably half of that. So that's where we're, we're picking up these categories. Uh, up, up, we're picking up categories just because people aren't there. Um, in terms of classroom supplies. So we're gonna see some favorable variances in those categories, probably some pretty good variances in our utilities. Um, so that's where we're picking up these types of dollars. They're one time, they're not gonna be sustainable, uh, but it also helps uh, provide that buffer as we head into next year. So while I don't necessarily like adopting a 21 budget in September, I think there's a lot of variables out there that if we were to start to make decisions at this point in time, they're probably the wrong decisions. Uh, this gives us the appropriation to move forward and then it allows us to come back in 
uh, meet our obligation to fully adopt by September 30th, but looks a little more like what we think we're going to experience as we go into the year. So uh, that's the point I wanted to point out on this. Uh, the other thing is when you get out to the end uh, with our modeling, this is the way that it typically looks. Uh, you get into that last year of it, it looks like we're insolvent. Uh, I think since I've been doing this for the last 12, 14 years, it always looks like the fifth year we're done. Uh, never has happened, obviously, because you make adjustments as you go. But what really drives that decline into that negative fund balance is our capital equipment approach. We have been kicking the can down the road, so to speak, and buying the critical things that we need and deferring where we can. So if I defer this year, that has an effect that pushes everything out. So we keep pushing things out into that last year. And so when you see that capital investment jump from uh, FY24 to 2.7 to 5.9, that's not a realistic number, but it's reflective of what's in our capital plan at this point in time. So uh, you'll always, we'll probably always see that unless we have a unique and dedicated funding mechanism for our capital. So that's why the fifth year always looks, looks the worst. Uh, Probably more valuable as we look at FY21, excuse me, FY22, uh, we're still okay. Uh, we're still in a good position. Um, and again, it's all gonna come down to what happens this coming year on enrollment. Enterprise funds, no changes there. Um, I, I think there's probably gonna be an impact on the food service side of it, it based on the way we're gonna be conducting some of our classes and the loads that we bring on the campus. If we start doing, you're here one day a week, but then the second day you're online, a lot of that depends on the individual instructor and the way they choose uh, to deliver. Um, so we'll see. Uh, I think there might be the possibility of some utilization of CARES funding for that to offset some of that uh, because it is a loss of income that is really truly tied to disruption of campus operations. So we can probably supplant some of that um, lost revenue with the federal uh, allocation that we will receive. And this is just a breakout of how uh, enterprise funds, so it differs from the post-secondary fund. Uh, wages and benefits represent a smaller part because there's a lot of cost of goods sold in here. A lot more supplies purchases, uh, a lot fewer staff serving. So that's why the wage benefits percentage is much smaller on the enterprise funds. That's it at a very high level. Again, it, it, a lot of this is just a follow up from the, the lengthy presentation I did back in May. Uh, you know, the one change in the federal category and the revenue. Again, taking the conservative approach, leaving some dollars potentially on the table. Uh, if we see a decline in revenue or in enrollments, that enrollments there will look to program that and we'll uh, start the argument about where we think that should go and have that ready to go so that we can present that in uh, in September. So, questions? Um, should I open up for public hearing just quick? And then, yeah. Since we have nobody. I'm opening up for public hearing. Seeing no one, we'll move on to questions. Closing the public hearing. Um, questions. I'm looking at the capital expenses going forward. Um, are you, over time, taking into consideration, I'm just thinking of like the new tech building with the transfer from so not that's not in that budget at all. No. So, okay. Not at that. Not at this point. Uh, I think that's something that we're, it will have to be yeah. conversations that we're having this year. Um, on what it, it, it's such a unique situation because it it's really just a balance sheet transfer. I mean, the ownership and the title stays the same. Right. Um, it's just moving it out of. It, and even it doesn't exist in a fund because it's on a government-wide statement. It's all a bunch of county mumble jumbo, but uh, it it doesn't even change that. But it's how do we transfer that? Uh, clearly, there's some value into it, or I would assume that the K-12 side mm -hmm. would see that there's value to that building, and there there should be some type of transfer. Uh, the really challenge for us is how do we afford it? Mm -hmm. How do we how do we carry that on? How do we take that on? Uh, the operation side of it is easier. Mm -hmm. uh, the capital investment side of it is more challenging, uh, especially in the way we're structured. Uh, 
our facilities are all funded uh, and acquired for the most part by the uh, Health and Education Facility Authority uh, through the issuance of debts that they do system wide. They are uh, tapped out or tapped out maybe is a better word to use. So there's a maximum amount that they're allowed in the legislature to carry as bonded debt. They're very close to that. I think that's why you saw the dollar increase this year because there's also ratios that they're required to maintain in, in terms of debt uh, service coverage ratios. So they need to generate a certain amount of revenue. So uh, point being is there's it's not a resource that we can go to and look to. Uh, right. At and this so point. that's why maybe long term planning with the district and yeah. Dr. Stephen and Todd to, to be to kind of come up with some type of yeah. And, strategy. and Todd and I have, have talked. Um, we haven't put pen to paper on what those numbers look like. Uh, we've had the building appraised um, that uh, Jeff Kreider and I mm. uh, put together and, and worked on and developed. So we have an appraised value on it. That doesn't necessarily mean, as you're well aware of, that doesn't mean that's what the market value <laughs> probably is. Uh, we're going to say it is, but uh, uh, we're, we don't get to unilaterally determine that. So uh, that's part of that conversation. And then the funding mechanism. Technical institutes, I suppose, tech uh, from the school district standpoint could possibly do a revenue bond. Mm -hmm. um, generally, your bonds are GO, general obligation bonds, uh, possibly a capital outlay certificate. But again, that's property tax supported dollars. So how do we write that arrangement that we're paying, that in effect, we're paying for that purchase through the debt that you either choose to take on or you have enough to fund it, you know, where it becomes a in simpler terms, the contract for deed uh, type of an arrangement. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's a lot of topics out there. There's a lot of discussion going on. Uh, clearly, we're trying to look uh, from our side of it, from a foundation standpoint, are there partners out there that would be willing to uh, come in with us from an investment standpoint? Is there interest in that? So we're exploring that. So uh, there's a lot of balls in the air. There's a there's um, kind of slow movement at this point, but that'll start to accelerate as we get closer. And that will have to be projected in our FY22 uh, budget. That'll be a part of it, whatever that decision is made. Typically when I do the five-year projections, I tend to just look at what do we know today that we're, we're certain on it. You get into the what ifs and I, I probably would never get it done because there's so many variables to it. So it's kind of reflecting knowing what we know today, where we sit today, if we carried on this way, how would it look? And then we recognize that every year we come in and make those adjustments through the annual budget process and then that again reflects. So um, it, it's not a true visionary of this is where we think we want to be. It's more about knowing what we know today, this is where we will be. Thank you. Rich, this is my first time getting to see your budget, so I have a quick question. Sure. Maybe you did cover it. You didn't want to sit through the whole 40 minutes last time. Mm -hmm. well, sure. Um, on the, the revenue side, yeah. um, specifically that Perkins, um, the federal revenue, mm -hmm. the 69729, uh, mm -hmm. I see that that is um, observed in the fiscal year 21 for that 23 million six hundred ninety eight thousand mm -hmm. so when I go over to see how then it's reflected by category um, I see that we have that in there at the top for the operating revenue and mm -hmm. we've observed that and then we have the total revenue up by a million when you list it by category which page are you looking at yeah. um, and they're not numbered so I'm not sure but it would be, it looks like this. This one. PowerPoint. Okay. Yep, in PowerPoint. Nan, would you, which page so we can all be at? Here, I'll flip it back here. But I was going to show it, which would it look like. This page here, you, correct. Right. So you see underneath that starts out with that same number that you're carrying over from the, when you categorize the revenue and use the categories at the 23 million for fiscal year 21 okay. and then it's observed under the fiscal year 21 budget the revenue side at the 23 mm -hmm. then what's carried down over the total revenue it's at 24 million oh 
Yeah, that should be that should be stay the same. That okay. should be twenty three. Okay. And then and I'll tell and you then what that makes sense because then I yeah. saw on the next yep. if you go to the first page of your yep. um, vocational fund, this one was at the twenty three six ninety eight. So right. I wasn't sure which one no. you were going off. No, of it's twenty three six ninety eight. I'll tell you what happened. Okay. Um, I went to pull this PowerPoint off of the slide I had at home okay. and I pulled it up and I go, oh crap, it's the wrong one. <laughs> okay. And so I started to make changes to my PowerPoint that I brought in today. Uh, it was reflected right on what was presented in your board documents. Okay. It wasn't in this PowerPoint that I presented. I didn't catch that one. So, okay. but yes, the revenue is. Uh, so the is revenue is the 23 million. 698. As to the 24. Yes. And yes. then I didn't have time to quickly do if the expenses were they figured yeah. off the 23 or the 24. It's it's the so 23. That's just a typo. Okay. Got yeah. it. Great. Yeah. Because the, the revenue and the expenditures in 21 are a balanced budget. Okay. So. Yeah, that was a typo on my Okay, my yeah, part. no one. So. That's fine. I just wanted to make sure I understood that and I saw that. Mm -hmm. And that's a one time, is that a one time revenue? Um, um, Perkins allocation or? changes year to year, but it's pretty steady in that $600,000 range, six hundred and fifty. dollars covered that. Okay, yeah. got it. Yeah, in the $650,000 range. Uh, there's an additional amount that comes in Perkins this year because we're part of a consortium. Okay. Um, it's not the standard uh, Carl B. Perkins allocation. It's an additional one, but it is still a Perkins Reserve account, so that's why it's up a little bit. Got it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. That's a good catch. Other questions for Rich? Okay. Seeing none, do I have a motion to tentatively adopt the FY21 budget for Southeast Technical College? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second for the discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. We have tentatively adopted the FY21 budget. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Move on to the Higher Learning Commission Comprehensive Visit Prep Report. Thank you. President Mickelson, members of the board, my name is Phoenicia Foster. I'm serving in the associate dean position now um, of curriculum instruction. So I'll bring to you our update on our path to reaccreditation. I know I came, uh, oh geez, I think it was a year ago, April. And so this is a little bit similar, but to uh, share with you the progress we've made and where we're headed this next year. So just um, as an awareness, we're part of our, the Higher Learning Commission, that's our regional accreditation. And there's the, the four pieces to that with the guiding values, assumed practices, federal compliance, and then the criteria for evaluation. So um, much of this will focus on our criteria for evaluation. So there are now two pathways. We are on the open pathway. This was what was uh, we were transitioned to a, a couple of years ago. And so uh, we're kind of at the end of this, but we were given an extra year a couple times. And so that's why um, it's, it hasn't always followed that what year we're in. Um, so with our assurance review, which happens in year 10, um, that's where um, we will explain how we comply with the criterion and core component. Core component. That's a very large document um, that has lots of pieces of evidence that comes with it. And that's what we're starting to develop here uh, for the next couple of years. The second piece is the quality initiative. And so we had talked about some different ideas for that, but an update there is we applied and were accepted into HLC's Assessment Academy, um, which was supposed to start this past spring, but the start date has been postponed until uh, the end of October. And that's a four-year commitment that I'll explain a little bit more in just a minute. Uh, just a minute. And then as far as that comprehensive evaluation, which will happen in 2022-23, that's where we have our federal compliance. We've got a student opinion survey this large assurance document, and then there will, 
I think it will end up being an on-site peer review, peer review visit. Um, Mitchell Tech is doing theirs this fall, and they still, last I had talked to them, and maybe you all have an update, they weren't quite certain yet if that was going to be on-site or virtual, but we're still going to, we're not planning on this being delayed due to the pandemic. It sounds like it will carry on on the timeline that we're given. So just as part of that Assessment Academy, it's a four-year um, process, um, a great resource to be part of. Um, it's a mix of in-person or now virtual um, on-campus or events um, that were part of a cohort with some other institutions and that will work with some assessment experts and scholars um, from across the country that will help us develop a project um, and pilot it and we'll refine it and evaluate it and then hopefully expand and sustain it on our campus. And so we'll be working with them uh, starting this fall. Uh, we're working on um, identifying that team right now of five to eight individuals um, from across campus, not just academics, but it will include um, IT and enrollment management um, and the, the business area um, and then uh, the academic representation as well. As far as our timeline, um, last year when I came to you, we were at that top level. And um, so we did do, prior to the pandemic, we did have some opportunities to um, reach out and, and educate. And we um, gave some different assignments to the various committees across campus and started collecting some information and some evidence that way. And then also in our M&M meetings, we were able to um, promote the criteria um, and do some in engaging and interactive uh, pieces through that. And so we got three of the five uh, done before we ended up uh, moving to the, the virtual, um, our virtual world. And then we did apply and were se selected to the academy. So we had some great progress last year. Um, this summer, what we're doing right now is establishing, there's the five criteria. So we're trying to establish those teams and create the co-chair arrangement. And so then we'll, they'll start working. And I'll explain what their tasks are in just a minute. We should get our site visit date uh, sometime this fall if it goes as scheduled and those teams will continue to work this year with the goal of having a first draft of our assurance argument ready by next summer. So a little bit more um, explained the timeline there if, um, as far as a month by month general idea of, of where we're going um, with the Criterion teams meeting. Um, I'll explain the HLC engage uh, tasks um, in just a moment and then some um, as far as outlines in the assurance argument. So as far as those criterion teams, um, the purpose would be to collect the information and our ev evidence to address the components. We wanna really identify our strengths and our areas concer of concern now so we can try to shore those up uh, prior to the, um, to the visit, collect our evidence, and then ideally develop an outline. So these teams aren't going to be writing the whole piece but giving an outline that then um, I can work to fill in. And so just kind of the structure for that. I'm hoping by July 15th um, that we'll have those Criterion teams in place so that we can get this launched this fall. And then because, you know, budget's pretty exciting, but I've also taught math and physics, which aren't so exciting, right? So you always know that you gotta generate a little bit of excitement. And so, and to continue, because not everyone will be involved on those Criterion teams, but we need everyone to be engaged in this process and to be um, knowledgeable. And we'll definitely need some of your expertise as well on different pieces of this. And so putting together this engaged challenge and so working on a challenge for each of the criteria this next year um, in kind of a, a competitive fun format, just um, maybe some scavenger hunts, trivia, um, kind of create a jingle kind of thing where we'll have some prizes um, throughout the year. And so that's to try and get everyone, it's not, and we hear it often, oh, it's for HLC. We just gotta do this for HLC, but to see it's more, it's about equality and improving uh, what we do and how we go about it. And so that's our, um, our wider initiative to, to get the campus involved. Any questions? Well, thank you for all this work. I've worked on accreditation teams and it's basically like professional stalking to gather all the information and <laughs> get it in. So I know it's a lot of work. So thank you for that. And especially in today's world, it makes it a little more difficult sometimes to track down that information when people aren't working in the same buildings and so forth. But um, what this will do if we do all the work on the forefront will allow us to not have to be doing this as often and um, reap the rewards of being reaccredited by the HLC. So thank you for all your work that you're doing in this. Yeah, I would just echo that. I think sometimes it's, you know, even in the nursing world, we say if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen, you know, and so it's really just documenting the great work that you're already doing and, um, and obviously finding those challenges that we're having too and finding ways to improve those. But it is a lot of paperwork and a lot of 
writing down stuff that may, maybe seems obvious or seems kind of like a dull moment, but you still have to account for it. So um, thank you for, it's not always an easy task. And so to be able to take other people's documents and then kind of elaborate on them and make them complete documents is um, it's a talent. <laughs> so thank you for your work. And I think um, some of your approaches as far as trying to get everybody involved, it is important that people know they, they want to go to a quality school and they want to go to a, a quality um, program. And so they can be part of making sure that um, their feedback is heard too. So. Thank you. Do I have a uh, motion to acknowledge the report on the reaccreditation? So moved. Second. A motion and second. All those in favor of um, uh, tentative or approval of the report signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Benjamin, thank you. Good morning, President Mickelson, members of the board. Uh, we wanted to provide you with an update on academics. You see how important it is on our budget as Rich presented to have student engagement. And it's also important to realize that our students are hands-on students. Many of the students expect that face-to-face -face, and they come to Southeast Tech because we provide that. So our goal is to ensure that our students have a very safe environment, our faculty have a safe environment, we're able to meet those learning objectives uh, for both accreditation and continued uh, enrollment of the school. So we wanted just to kind of give you an update of things that we're doing to ensure that we can continue to move forward with a as much of a traditional, normal, if there is such a, a term anymore, start for the fall as possible. So. We, we prevented last month at the last board meeting our phases to reopening things like wearing masks and ensuring that we have proper equipment and sanitation and everything in place. We've also gone a step further in academics where we've really looked at each individual classroom and determined how many students can we fit? How do we set this um, classroom up for, for instruction and how do we ensure students can interact with an instructor? One of the approaches we're doing, we're giving faculty several different resources and tools to do that. One is what we call um, a bi-modality uh, form of education where the instructor can simultaneously teach to students in class and online at the exact same time. So they can have half the class there and half at home online. A Little bit more challenging because it's really having to interact and how do you engage those students. Uh, we, have a, we do have a lot of faculty that are um, trained on it and I think we do very well, but that's one option. The other option again is splitting the class in half. Classes typically are Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, twice a week, or half to come on Monday, half come on Wednesday. And the, they present the same lecture twice in the week. And then what they typically would do on the Wednesday class, it's all online, so the kind of a hybrid model uh, I think that's the model that most of our instructors are going to, to take with being able to present, interact, and ensure student uh, interaction and in, in the learning objectives. The other component is the formation of the academic leadership team that we'll be able to really track and monitor the quality of the education, that the learning management system is being properly used, that information is being compiled and students are being engaged so that we are meeting our, our learning objectives. We really feel this, this uh, multi-pronged approach is really going to ensure a strong quality education where we'll be able to keep students engaged and ensure that we can deliver all of the objectives. We're also planning and preparing for the unlikely event or just in case we end up having to go completely online. And we have things in place that we're working on with faculty and staff that students can continue to get that same experience. So we're hoping that we don't have to implement those, but. Uh, something that we're prepared for. Questions? I'm sorry, thank you. If they are doing the hybrid model, uh, will those classes, say the ones that are in person, still also be videotaped for? Yes. Yeah, okay. So when they do the, the hybrid model, what the instructor will do is they'll, they'll videotape their lecture, post it online so all students can see it. So it actually works out somewhat to an even a higher advantage because if you have a student because of life, everything, they, they tend to miss a class, work, family, they still lose out now. Right now, they kind of lose out and they have to make that opportunity or that time to meet with the instructor or fellow classmate. They can get all that now. 
So it really is a, a stronger form of, of delivery. It's a great service for the students. Well, and for some students, it may, there may be lectures that they would like to re-listen to mm -hmm. as well. You know, maybe they, they were distracted by whatever, or they didn't catch a topic or um, concept or something. And so for them to have the ability to go back, I think is good. Um, we might also, you know, I think we hear a lot from the people who want to come back, but we may also have students who can't for whatever reason. And so if they chose to do just an online, they would still have that option to listen to the one that they maybe would have attended in person, but then also still um, get that second day online as well and be able to participate and interact. So yeah, I think having those multiple options um, available will be very helpful for students to kind of choose their path um, for whatever works for them personally. Thank you. Any other questions for Benjamin? Seeing none, do I have a motion to acknowledge the academic affairs update on fall semester start? I'll move. Second. I have a motion and second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you. The report is acknowledged. Any other business? Seeing none, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. moved. Second. Motion and second. All those in favor of adjourn adjournment signify by saying aye. 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 Go same sign. We are adjourned. Thank you.